the port of Hamburg, Germany's gateway to the world and the third largest port in Europe. This area, which looks like building land, is actually a toxic waste site. Beneath the surface lies Hamburg's legacy of industrial pollution. Before this land can be developed, toxins that have long been banned in Germany must be removed from the soil. It's a job for experts. The cleanup is expensive and some toxins are hard to identify. But all the toxins found here pose serious health threats. The whole product range of toxins is buried here with the industry we have in Hamburg. There are PACs, polycyclic aromatic carbohydrates, tar oils, benzols, glues, all sorts of stuff. It all has to be removed from the soil before the land can be used again. The removal of these toxins will cost taxpayers 500 million euros. But just on the other side of this fence, toxins that are just as dangerous are entering the port every day. They're hidden in containers. The toxins are invisible. There's no telling which container or which shipment is contaminated. But textiles from Asia are among the goods most commonly affected. Every day, large quantities of them arrive in Hamburg. To find out how these toxins affect people, we meet Julia Neumann. The 24-year-old used to work for the clothing retailer H&M. She was in contact with clothing shipments from Asia on a daily basis, unpacking them and putting them on display. At first, she started to get tired very quickly. Then her eyes and her stomach hurt, and in the end, she became ill with nephritis. She rarely goes back to her old employer. The memory is still too painful. I'm reminded of the last time I was here and what it was like then. I was in a bad state. It makes me wonder what could have happened if I had stayed there. If I hadn't been diagnosed, I wonder how sick I would be then and how I would still be harming myself. Julia Neumann was lucky. She happened to watch a report on television which made her aware of the problems of toxins in clothing. The test they carried out on a pair of jeans from H&M showed that they were contaminated with industrial chemicals. And that made me think that my sickness might have something to do with the clothes. The program makers tested various jeans for toxins and the ones from H&M immediately stood out. We noticed that the brand Jeans Royale had an unpleasant smell. When we examined it, we found chlorbenzol, dichloranilin and trichloranilin in small quantities. These substances are hazardous to human health, and that's why we were concerned. H&M stopped selling the jeans, but Julia Neumann wondered whether these chemicals had affected her health. In Germany, there is a recommendation which says that these toxins should not be used in production. After testing her blood, Neumann's doctor recommends that she should avoid contact with the chemicals, which means quitting her job. Her doctor comes to this conclusion after carrying out a lymphocyte transformation test. The lymphocyte transformation test showed that live cells of yours came into contact with the chemicals dichloranilin, trichloranilin and chlorbenzol. It showed that the anilin lead to strong reactions. We have a stimulation index to measure this. Anything up to 3 is considered a normal reaction, but in your case we reached a 10. And if you look at this reaction, then you can only say that you must no longer come into contact with these substances as you were while you were unpacking new textiles. Is Julia Neumann an unfortunate but isolated case? No, Julia Neumann is not an isolated case. The number of patients that suffer as a result of exposure to these chemicals is on the increase worldwide. But how are people like Julia Neumann to know which clothes contain the toxins and which don't? 
She knows of other former colleagues who are slowly getting ill. She's going to meet a young colleague to warn him. He too has been suffering for years. He doesn't want to talk on camera, but Yulia tries to persuade him. I'm 24 years old and I'm starting out again from scratch. I have to learn to do a new job because I can no longer do my own one. I'm starting at zero again. I can be happy that I'm still standing here. If I had noticed it any later, then I might have lost my kidneys. But Yulia's ex-colleague prefers to remain silent. In uncertain economic times, the fear of becoming jobless is still greater than that of becoming ill. He's worrying about how to pay his rent. If I had been alone, I also wouldn't have been able to quit my job. It's just not an option when you're alone, and that's why he's scared. I understand him. It's so easy to lose one's social status. What can he do? Will they continue to pay his wages if he now too comes with such allegations? You just don't know. Maybe they will throw him out? H&M refuses to comment on camera. In a letter they tell us there is no proof of a definite connection between Julia's health complaints and her work. The letter also points out that there are no legal regulations concerning residues of chloranilin in clothing. In this, the company is right. The chemicals must not be used in Germany, but residues are not illegal. How can this be? We try to find out what's behind this legal loophole. Tirupur in southern India. We're in the textile capital of the world. The clothes produced here on the cheap are sold all over the world. H&M is one of the big name customers here, but we're not told which company works for them. All suppliers are contractually obliged to guarantee that the use of dangerous chemical substances is strictly controlled. The Indian manufacturers have to ensure that the clothes they make do not contain dangerous toxins. H&M carries out random spot checks and says it only rarely comes across violations. Such contracts are well known to this factory and the manager says they have never had any problems. Yeah, we, we made an export of a Furachi buyer. Namely, it's a popular brand around the Italian countries. We have made uh, 25,000 pieces of exports to them. It's a nice concern. And also uh, Hennes and Maurits? Yeah, previously we have worked with the uh, Hens and Mortals. H and M, namely. We want to find out more about textile production in Tirupur. Not far from the sewing factory, we come across a cotton bleaching plant. The company uses chlorinated bleach products from Western companies with Indian subsidiaries, such as the German chemicals giant BASF. Chlorobenzine is used in the bleaching process. That's one of the toxins which made Julia Neumann sick. In the highly competitive clothing market, every cent counts. Europe's fashion discounters do everything to undercut their competitors. Producing in India helps cut costs. There are no signs to warn them of the chemicals. As hardly any of the workers can read or write, written warnings are useless anyway. To color the cotton and protect it against insects, it has to be treated with countless pesticides. The clothes also have to be made soft so that they are comfortable and feel good on our skin. Traces of the chemicals used for softening also end up in people's blood. The work is often done by families who are entirely dependent on the income from a bleaching plant. Children also have to help. The textiles drying here are sold as t-shirts for two euros in Europe. After the bleaching, the textiles are dyed. We are still in Tirupur. The most common color is black. That's what sells best in Europe. Black is always beautiful in Europe. But 
But this has big disadvantages for the people working here. For the textiles to stay black and not turn grey, they have to be treated with particularly aggressive dye. Many of them have large debts to pay off and have no choice. But one of the workers tells us only few manage to do this work for longer than two years. He too is suffering from early symptoms. He says the hair on his arms and legs has disappeared and his skin burns. He sees no way out. It's hard to find better working conditions in Tirupur. Once the textiles reach the Düsseldorf Fashion Fair, nobody asks how they were made. Consumers have no way of knowing which substances are retained in the clothing. Testing is voluntary and the authorities don't force the industry to ensure that no toxins end up on our skin. Some 90% of textiles sold in Europe now come from India and China. There is fierce competition between the two countries, which means that only the price counts. The question of chemical residues does not enter the equation. But the responsibility to ensure that textiles are safe is completely offloaded onto foreign manufacturers. The German importers try to gloss over the country of origin. Design in Germany. Yeah. What does that mean? It means that it was designed in Germany. Hardly anybody still produces textiles in Germany. Basically, it's just a little bit made in Germany. We are given a certification. I don't know exactly how it's checked, but I assume that's taken care of. It's not a product you can produce here for a sensible price. You might as well knit your own sweater. But also the wool has to be dyed somewhere. Less than a thousand textiles a year are tested for toxins in Germany by independent laboratories. This, although residues from certain colors, are highly cancerous. But despite all the regulations the fashion labels impose on their producers in India and China, the German TÜV Rheinland, an agency for product safety, regularly finds traces of toxins. By textilien finden wir leider immer noch Unfortunately, we are still finding forbidden azo dyes in clothing, which is the result of not dyeing the textiles properly. We also find residues of pesticides in shipments from certain regions in the world, where the textiles have to be protected against insects. Back in India's cotton belt, Nowhere else in the world are so many pesticides used in farming as here. Highly toxic chemicals are sold in shops like these. We take a look at what's for sale here. Confidor, made by the German chemicals giant Bayer, is a pesticide that is suspected of being so harmful to humans and animals that Europe is debating banning its use. But we also find products that contain endosulfan, a substance that's long been banned in Europe and the US. But here in India, German companies continue to let others produce it. The pesticide kills insects on cotton plants, but causes cancer in humans and can damage their central nervous system. In this shop, we find many of the substances that have long been forbidden in Europe. But again, business interests override all health concerns. I see in your background you have monocrotophos, you have endosulfan, you have quinalophos, you have chlorophyophos. All this, all this, all these pesticides are banned in Europe, but you are still selling them here. We are selling them. We are selling them, but too too small, small day. Couldn't eat any of them. India's cotton farmers have been growing genetically modified cotton plants for some years now. The goal was for the plants to be more resistant to insects and to save money on pesticides. But they continue to be used anyway, like on this field. The dosis is measured only roughly. Most of the sprayers can't even read the instructions. 
They have no idea what they're handling and no idea what they risk by coming into contact with these toxins. Nobody takes the necessary precautions to protect themselves. The wages are low, just enough to survive and keep the workers dependent for the time being. I have been seriously poisoned by quinolophos several times. I was unconscious in hospital for two weeks, but I survived. And we have no choice but to spray when the worms come, otherwise we lose our crop. This hospital in Varangal is full of people who are suffering from pesticide poisoning. There are no authorities in India that bother to research how many people actually die from overexposure to pesticides. Julia Neumann was made sick by toxic residues in clothing. We know this from independent tests. She can no longer work as a decorator in the fashion retail sector. She has come to Hamburg's Institute for Occupational Medicine for a checkup. She's fighting to have her health problems recognized as work related. It's a tough battle. The Institute specializes in poisoning. But it's very difficult to prove that there is a direct link to the workplace, as toxins are not only present in clothing. Julia Neumann is thoroughly examined once more by the experts. Today they're also checking her respiratory tracts. The tests show that they've been affected. The leading doctor says it's highly likely that residues from imported textiles have made Julia Neumann sick. But dichloranilin and trichloranilin are both substances the institute has no experience with. We have no experience with these substances here, and we are not sure whether these are really the substances causing the problem, or if it's some other substance that is an imported textile. There are many more chemical residues. Rainer Speck has also come to the Institute for Occupational Medicine, because he suspects he may have become sick due to exposure to industrial chemicals. He has been very jittery for several years, but he says he didn't have the money for a blood test. By waiting so long, he's made it even harder to prove anything. There are no traces left in his blood. What were your responsibilities from 1989? Receiving the goods and unloading the container. The driver only opened the doors and we unloaded the container. And when the container was empty, me and my colleagues cleaned it out removed nails, and sometimes threw away tins. You didn't notice any respiratory problem? Coughing or shortness of breath? Coughing? Sure. Only when you went into the container or all the time? Yeah, more or less. I never knew what was actually in there. The warehouse worker is a difficult case for Dr. Preiser. 
Die Ursachen ähm, der Vergiftung, we are trying da to forschen find wir out daran, also wir versuchen herauszufinden, welche, welche Stoffe sich wirklich really handelt hier. Und auch we are das, was wir more nachweisen, es wird immer comes mehr. From the chemical residues ähm, es kommt die chemikalische Rückstände, es sind Begasungsmittelrückstände. Und wir versuchen eben nachzuweisen, problem. dass auch wirklich diese Stoffe dann ursächlich sind für die gesundheitlichen Schwerden. Diese sind ja auch häufig sehr unspezifisch. Giddiness, difficulties, also es handelt sich um es handelt sich um Schwindel oder um Konzentration. Also Beschwerden, über die viele Menschen klagen. More research still needs to be done in Hamburg, but the research of the Institute for Work Medicine has shown one thing already. Every fifth container that arrives here has traces of contamination from toxic gases. The Institute started to look into the problem after more and more customs workers showed signs of poisoning after opening containers. Many containers, especially those containing textiles, are sprayed with chemicals to prevent insects from ruining the goods during their long journey to Europe. The problem is that the treated containers are not even marked, so that those opening them have no warning. A special measuring device has been developed for the customs officials in Hamburg to check the air contamination inside the container before opening it. If the levels are too high, a chemist has to come and do further checks. But this regulation only applies to Hamburg customs, and only a small percentage of containers are actually opened here. We have been operating under the guideline recently that no container is opened before we have carried out a toxicological test. Many containers are x-rayed and we can see what we need to see on the x-ray, so that we don't even have to open the container. But if we are unsure, then we have to open the container. Before we open it, we do a toxicological test. Given the mass of containers, many go unchecked. The customs officials can only carry out spot checks, but if they come across toxins, they take great precautions. All these safety precautions delay the shipments. It's not good for business. The gas is odorless and colorless. It's called methyl bromide. Even breathing in very small amounts can cause irreparable damage to the central nervous system. That's why methyl bromide is banned in Europe, but it still arrives regularly here at the port of Hamburg. How can this be? We trace it back to this container port in Hong Kong. What is packed and loaded here is destined for Europe. The goods travel halfway around the world, but still European regulations even apply here. Since 2005, the EU requires almost all containers to be fumigated to prevent the spread of harmful insects. But why are there no warning signs on the containers? We track down a fumigation station. Hoses are stuck into the container. The EU demands that workers be protected by first airing out the containers properly. Their straw hats protect the workers only from the sun, but the invisible risk is ignored. We're not welcome. The owner asks us what we want. We ask if the containers are fumigated in accordance with EU regulations, but he doesn't want to talk to us. Peeking through his fence, we soon see why. The containers are fumigated here without any attempt to warn other workers and protect them. We want to find out more. I don't know, I don't know, long here. We explain that we have a filming permit and that we want to know what's happening here, how they fumigate. But it's no use, we're told to stop filming. But on our way out, we notice a car from Asia Pest Control. 
a company that advertises with a claim that it fumigates in compliance with EU regulations. They use methyl bromide, a substance banned in Europe. It kills insects, but its residues are dangerous for humans too. Here in Hong Kong, the pesticides are officially used in compliance with EU safety regulations. Our research leads us to mainland China. Here too, many containers are fumigated before they are shipped across the world. We arrange a secret meeting with some port workers. They are all worried about the work they do. They are required to degas and clean containers. Every day they open and close hundreds of containers. Many of them are seriously ill already, but drag themselves to work anyway. They need the money to sustain their families. When I started working here, I was fine. But after two years, I began to feel very ill. And not just me. All of my colleagues had the same problem. If you constantly breathe in these fumes, you start to feel worse and worse. Now, after four years, I'm so sick that it's very hard for me to come to work. But I still don't know the name of my illness. All I know is that it's getting worse. I've already turned to the work safety agency and also to the police because of the poisoning. But they didn't really know what to do either. China also produces methyl bromide, the substance that's banned in Europe. It's very convenient because it's such a reliable insecticide. The EU stipulates that certain containers have to be fumigated, but only under strict safety precautions. But port workers and customs officials here and in Europe are getting sick. It's the high price of global trade. But not just in China, here in India too, German companies get away with business practices which would cause lots of trouble back home. This is where the waste from the production of industrial chemicals ends up. And this is where those chemicals are produced. We're in Quadalore, one of the main sites in India for the production of industrial chemicals. Sodali makes textiles soft and clean. Chloroform is used to make dichlormethane and trichlormethane highly toxic substances used to protect the textiles from mold and insects. The EU seems to have lost the overview of all the toxins entering Europe. Whether due to the air in the containers or the toxins in the goods, more and more people are becoming ill. And nobody really knows what exactly is being allowed into Europe anymore. Ironically, an EU guideline makes export countries fumigate their goods with substances which are banned here in Europe. But these very substances are now endangering European port workers every day. Rotterdam, January 2009. We're at a conference of Dutch transport unions when this port worker suddenly collapses. He has been exposed to toxins and his brain has suffered serious long-term damage. Professor Bauer, the chief medical practitioner of Hamburg's Work Medicine Institute, is in the middle of a speech when the worker suffers his attack. Uh, Dr. Bauer, I do it word. Thank you, Anja. I think it's a bit difficult to go continue after this event, which shows more than all I can tell you and my voice will show you. And I should say, as a medical doctor, I don't have any doubt that that what we saw, the generalized seizure cramps, are due to severe intoxication by methyl bromide. It deals with a problem. Millions of workers are in danger. The problem for the victims is that they alone have to prove that the toxins are responsible for their sickness. But how are they to know this without any warning signs? Container, the 
Containers that include these toxins have to be marked. So formally, these work safety regulations do exist, also internationally. The problem is that nobody enforces them. Even if there are controls, there are no sanctions. Those who break the regulations are not punished. And there's another problem. Not every container has to be opened at the port of Hamburg, even if customs officials know it is contaminated. Oh yeah, schwer belastet. Zeig auf Tor an. Okay. A0. Der Kanal B hat einen Vollausschlag. Den Kanal G. 0. Und auf dem Kanal H auch Vollausschlag 6. If you were to breathe in the air from this container, you would seriously harm yourself. The chief work safety inspector is called. Wow, that's a very high reading. That's much too high. Channel B indicates highly toxicological substances, probably some kind of chlorine compound. And also on channel H, it shows vaporous substances such as benzol, tolol, and whatever else is in there. It's all far above the normal levels. This container really poses a health risk, but we cannot protect the public. We are only here to protect the health and safety of our own colleagues. This stamp is the only thing they have to warn others. It's bright red with an exclamation mark and says that the air in the container is toxic. So, alles klar, die Papiere wieder. Und Vorsicht eben wegen der Schadstoffbelastung. Wir haben extra noch gestempelt, dass die Firma sich darum kümmert, dass der Container nicht so aufgemacht wird, dass man vorher guckt, was für Schadstoffe da drin sind. There is no law to stop the shipment. Due to EU regulations, the containers are simply marked with a red stamp and sent on their way, in this case to the Czech Republic. We want to know what happens to the toxic container, where does it end up and how is it opened. At first we manage to follow the truck but then at the border, we lose the trail among hundreds of other trucks. We know that the Czech customs are required to open all shipments. Did they notice our container with the warning stamps? I'm sorry, I can't tell you anything about it. I'm not authorized to do so. You can only film from a distance. The owners of the goods have to be protected. We put our questions to the Czech customs in writing and are told that the container was opened and sent on its way. The Czech authorities have no device to look for toxins. A red stamp is treated seriously though. Contaminated containers are always aired out, we're told. But we have a different impression. The customs officials are only responsible for checking that the goods are properly labelled. The Czech state collects import tax on everything. That is the main objective. Consumer protection or protecting customs officials plays no part. Textiles and shoes from Asia. Everything is unpacked. The bulk of the goods are only redirected here. The Czech Republic is a logistical hub. From here the goods are shipped in all directions and to shops all over Europe. This is the home of the textile discounter Kenvelo, a chain with outlets across Europe. The company's logistical hub is in Prague. The containers are unloaded here and the goods are distributed all over Europe. The contaminated container from Hamburg, which we lost at the border, is headed for the clothing retailer Kenvelo. We would have liked to interview Kenvelo and to ask these questions. Why are there no inspection tags on clothes? Do they carry out any of their own tests for toxic residues? Is the company at all concerned about the problem of toxins in imported clothing? Do they do anything to protect their staff? 
the German office in charge of the company's 265 stores in Germany sends us this answer. Quote, our buyers are currently on tour, and without them we cannot answer such specific questions. Thank you very much. Unquote. And the customers of these discount chains? Sometimes the only warning they get is a sticker telling them to wash the clothes before use. The companies are required to guarantee that their clothes are free of azo dyes, but no more than that. How many garments are actually tested, what exactly is tested, and who checks up on the manufacturers in India or China is not controlled by any independent authority. There should be legal guidelines and also limits which have to be enforced. And if the clothes are within those guidelines, then they're okay. If you want to buy cheap clothes, what do you expect? I think it's scary, especially if you think of your children wearing these clothes, but also for adults. Yes, it really makes you think. Something should be done about it. There need to be controls. But who carries out the controls? Over a period of four months, we look for somebody who is responsible for this problem, which, according to our investigation, remains a legal loophole. Finally, we find an expert for these chemicals at the Consumer Protection Authority. We arrange to meet at the port of Hamburg to test a shipment. There are dangerous substances in the container. But this doesn't mean that we have regulations which apply to exactly these substances in these goods. In most cases, the regulations are applied only to specific types of goods and specific substances. The idea is to protect the people who come into contact with these goods, but without restricting trade. The rule is there are no rules. The authorities are dragging their feet. In 2002, Rainer Speck found this. That's the symbol that I found on the container years ago, around 2002, and I've since confirmed it, methyl bromide. Was it also from China? I can't really say, because I only found such a label once. I knew from talking with this one transport company, I don't know the name anymore, or I can't remember it, but they said, when we come, we have to remove these stickers of yours, so that you won't be confronted, so that you don't even know what's going on. It's sometimes really hard for me to keep my hand, my fingers steady. It can be really awful. It bothers me when I'm eating or drinking. You can see it. It's messed up my whole life, both financially and in terms of my health. I can't really participate in anything anymore. The economic damage of the poison is hard to put into numbers. Experts estimate that it's a double-digit amount in the billions. A toy factory in China. Here, paints containing lead are used with no protection. Softeners are added to the PVC so that the dolls are nice and flexible. The most dangerous softeners are called thalets. They act like hormones that make our skin nice and soft. These forbidden substances have been found time and again in children's toys, even though they've been banned in Europe. But everyone manufactures in China these days, even the biggest toy company, Mattel. The makers of Barbie have already had to start massive recalls. Despite this, the company tells us that softeners are no longer a problem for Mattel. The Chancellor looks remarkably pliable in her Barbie doll form. Back at TÜV Rheinland, 
The European Poison Headquarters Hallo, rings the alarm bells weekly. So, the next test candidates. So, the next test candidates. Here, würde ich sagen, gehen wir auf Azofarbstoffe. Here, we're looking for azo dyes. Und bei den übrigen auf. And in the others, softeners. Good, thank you. In January 2009 alone, more than 1,300 harmful toys were found in Europe. TÜV Rheinland regularly tests purchases and is one of the few independent labs that checks on manufacturers. The tests are complicated and cost a lot of money. They only find chemicals that are already known or are specifically looked for. Mainly testers search for the usual suspects, azo dyes and softeners. We found banned softeners. We found them in the textile component. The whole inside smelled extremely badly. This doll is high grade. Actually, this doll is toxic waste and doesn't even belong on the German market. The only clue as to how this doll got here, you can see here, made in China. We got this doll from our test buyers. The unusual thing was that it didn't have any German writing on it. And that alone is enough to tell us that this product shouldn't even be allowed to be sold here. And then we looked at it to see if it contained toxins and found, once again, the banned softeners. That means that when a child has extensive contact with the toy, or if it comes into contact with saliva, for example, it could be very dangerous. Marie's doll is sick. The German toy maker Zapf has on several occasions had to recall its popular Annabelle doll. They were found to be highly contaminated with toxic softeners. For Marie, this means her doll could be giving her cervical cancer. The health of young boys is also at risk by the toxic softeners. The consequences could be disastrous. The fertility of young men is already decreasing. Many are showing lower sperm counts. The German Federal Environment Agency in Berlin analyzed urine samples of some 1,700 children for three years. The samples stem from children of all social backgrounds across Germany. During the testing period, the toxic softeners were already banned in Europe. The results of the study, which were made available to us exclusively, are shocking. Not a single urine sample was found to be free of toxins. The finding came as a big surprise even to the agency's experts. Alone the fact that there was no child which didn't carry these toxins or their residues in their urine is extremely worrying from our point of view. Especially as these substances work like hormones and can jeopardize the testicular development and function in small boys. This is our main concern because we see that in the last 50 years the sperm quality of German men has decreased significantly. We have more and more young men whose sperm count is so low they cannot father children. The toxins that are being brought back to Europe in these containers, although they are banned here, could well end up making many young men infertile in future. Experts are sounding the alarm bells and are calling for much stricter controls for workers and consumers alike. Attention, 